See this? This is the first terrain piece I ever made. I made it back in about 2001, I was 12 years old, and in addition to being the first piece I ever made, it was also the first tutorial I ever followed, because I got the design for this from a book called How to Make War Games Terrain. And that was a book that had all kinds of tutorials how to build your own stuff from scratch, stuff that's been a huge inspiration to the direction I've taken this channel. And one of the coolest things for me about having a YouTube channel has been introducing people to the joy of scratch building your own terrain in the same way that this book had that impact for me. So now that it's about 20 years later, I thought it'd be really cool to revisit this project and give it a modern take. So today, we're gonna make an entire medieval village that matches this, but takes some of these techniques to the next level. So the first thing I'm going to do is measure out the basic shape of the house on some black foam core board. Foam core board is used by little kids for presentations, but I like building things out of it because it's lightweight, it's easy to cut, and it has a little bit of thickness to it that make gluing the edges together much easier than, say, cardboard or something like that. So as you can see, I made something a little bit more advanced than a basic house shape. It's got a little bit of a lean-to bubble area sticking out on one side, and that's pretty nice. I'm happy with that. So the next thing I'm going to do is cut out the roof. And for this I'm using medium chipboard, I'll put a link in the description for this stuff, it's one of my favorite crafting materials. And I came up with this technique for making the roof lie flat by putting some blue masking tape on there. And I just trim the excess and that gives it a nice hinge, sort of like a book cover or something like that. And that avoids the hassle of trying to get the roof line to line up on both sides because it already lines up with the tape. So I just drape that over my building and that'll be a good roof line. For this one, because it has a little bit more of an advanced shape, I cut out that extra piece, put it on there, and then cut out a piece for that extra area there. Quick and easy, bang, 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 and there it is. So this is really quick to build a house like this. Like right now I've spent maybe 10 minutes building this thing. And I hot glue the roof on. I like to do it one side first because that makes it a little bit easier to make sure that the alignment is proper. And then I add the second side after. If you wanted to build a whole bunch of houses really quickly and wanted to keep them very light on detail, you could do it really quickly using this method. But we're gonna go a little farther and add a bunch more detail. So the first thing I do is using a sharp knife, I cut some chunks out of the corner and this will allow a little notch to accommodate a little beam made out of base wood. Base wood is like balsa wood, but it's a little bit stiffer, a little bit more rigid, and a little bit more durable. So for some terrain projects, I like to use it instead of balsa wood. And there you go. See, we have some nice beams on the corner. This is the start of the timbered look to this structure. Timbered structures have their structural beams showing on the outside, and it's a really iconic look. You get that nice Tudor style. It gives it a really distinctive medieval look. So I take some stir sticks that I bought off eBay. If you want, you could go to a coffee shop and ask for some. I've done in that in the past, but it's only a couple bucks to get like a thousand of them on eBay. And then I'm just going around and I'm adding these timbers to the outside of the structure. As you can see, it gives it pretty quickly a nice timber look. I had some diagonal braces in the corners like that. You're gonna wanna look at reference images for that. You don't just want random sticks going everywhere. It's not gonna look right. Take your time and look at a couple of buildings of medieval cottages and something like that. If you want to join my Discord or my Patreon, for example, we have a thread where we post inspiration images. It's meant to help with this sort of thing. So once I've done that, I put some horizontal pieces and I cut out the windows. And that's just a simple window that has some nice depth to it. You can see my finger poking through there. No big deal. To add a mullion to the window, I use a little bit of matchstick. And I quickly realized it's hard to do it through the front, so I go in through the back like that, and that worked out pretty nicely. The mullion adds quite a nice little detail that makes the window differentiated from the rest of the timbering on the house. The door is pretty similar. I cut out a door shape, and then here's this lightning quick method that I came up with. You put a bit of chipboard in behind, trace it out with a pencil, cut that piece out with some scissors, and then I just put glue on the whole shape and come in with a bunch of coffee stir sticks and just lay them all down overlapping the edges no big deal 
because we're just going to trim them all to length all together in the next step. And this saves a tremendous amount of time. The hardest thing about doing this, about adding these little timbers guys, is taking the time to measure and cut each one. So by doing this you actually save a fair bit of time. And to add a little bit of extra detail I'm going to add a cross brace, two cross braces I suppose, and a diagonal brace just to add some nice little detail. And I'm also going to add little pin pricks to represent nail holes using this compass. Pretty happy with that. Add some hot glue. And from in behind, I place that in the door. And as you can see, that method leaves it recessed as well, which adds a little bit extra detail, which looks great. Let's talk quickly for a moment about thatched roofs. What is thatch? Well, thatch is a roofing style made from layers of overlapping vegetation. In tropical climates, they thatch roofs with all kinds of different leaves. And in medieval Europe, they used to use rye and wheat and reeds. The thing about thatch is it has to be a certain thickness to work. In the movies, you see a lot of thatched buildings that are really thin and just, it wouldn't work that way. You know, the moisture would go straight through. You need to have a big thickness of a roof to do it. I did a little bit of research and I realized that for thatch to actually function properly, it has to be on like a 45 degree angle. And if the pitch of the roof is too shallow, then the moisture would just go right through and it also wouldn't work. So for that reason, this building that I'd already built couldn't be a thatched roof. We're going to shingle this one. We'll build another one to do a thatched roof on. So I decided to just quickly whip together another building that will accommodate the thatch. As you can see this one on the roof line I did these sort of curvy lines and that's going to accommodate some windows that are going to be peeking out from under the thatch. I came up with a new technique to do this where I cut these parallel grooves into the roof piece. It sounded like a kalimba. Move my snacks out of the way there. And when I put this down on the roof line after trimming this back a little bit you'll see that all of those independently cut parallel pieces of chipboard are going to act as a nice little curve to give the roof a little bit more character. With that done, I mark out with a pencil where I want my chimney to be and using some thin XPS bricks, I lay that in and then the chimney part above the roof, I just cut a bigger chunk of foam on an angle, trace that out with a pencil to groove in some bricks deepen them with a sharp, sharp X-Acto knife and then reinforce those grooves with the blunt end of a pencil and that gives me the nice bit of chimney that sticks up above the thatch. Let's take a look at today's sponsor guys. Really excited about this one, it's Warzone Studio. They sent me this mat and I'm actually really thrilled with it. Sometimes you get a battle mat but like It'll be the same pattern repeated over and over and over again and you look at it and it's almost like one of those magic eye paintings that you're supposed to cross your eyes and then you see like what are like a spaceship pop out or something like that and i'm really sensitive to that i'm really sensitive to like repeated patterns that aren't varied enough and they don't look good you know what i'm saying but i was thrilled with this mat because the pattern didn't jump out at me they've done a good job it's a subtle enough pattern and it repeats seamlessly in a way that doesn't draw your eye to it also Guys, this mat they sent me, double-sided, okay? So as you can see on the other side, there's a nice cobblestone pattern, which is perfect for Mordheim or D&D game that takes place in like an urban center of some kind. It's perfectly smooth. I haven't had any issues with miniatures tipping over, which I can't say the same for every mat and surface that I've ever played on. There's all sorts of different patterns and colors. You can get the mats in, you can get different sizes, you can get different materials. You can get three by three, four by four. I got a four by six because I like the older editions, big tables, that's kind of what I grew up with, but they got it all. So I, I totally recommend it guys, Warzone Studio, I'll put a link in the description below. Make sure you use that link so they know I sent you because I'd love to work with them again. I love to be able to promote products to you guys that I actually use myself and that I actually really like. So uh, go ahead, go over there, get yourself a mat, comes with a cool carrying case, you won't regret it. It's Eric's Hobby Workshop approved. So to simulate a thatched roof, I started off by going to Hobby Lobby and buying some faux fur. By the way, if you've never been to Hobby Lobby, this is probably my new favorite store. I love this place. You can see me having a grand old time here, picking out that faux fur. And I get this big bundle of faux fur home, give it a few slaps and a pat, and then uh, take a look at the grain. There's not such a pronounced grain. 
um, at least not as much as this other piece of leopard skin fur that I had lying around. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take an old comb and run it through and try to give it more of a directionality to the fur like a thatched roof would have. Then, using the structure itself, I measure out the edges of the roof, and with a very sharp X-Acto blade, I cut it from the back. What this does is it means I'm not cutting through all the hair, I'm just cutting through the mesh that holds the hair together. That way, when I glue it onto the roof, starting at the roof line with just one bead of glue, I don't have so many excess pieces of fur that have cut off from the substrate. Adding more glue as I go down allows me to get a nice precise lay of the fur. And the nice thing is there is a little bit of stretch to this mesh that the fur is mounted on. So you can stretch it right to the edges of your building if your measurements are a little bit imprecise as mine always are. So once I've got that down, I comb through. You can see a little bit of fur is coming out just from where the edges were trimmed. And then I come in with some scissors and I cut a nice haircut for the thatch. If you look at pictures of professionally thatched roofs, they cut them so they're pretty nice and neat so you get that sort of orderly, wholesome cottage feel. And that's what I wanted on this. Next, I add a piece for the roof line and that just gives it a little bit more realism and also covers that seam at the top of the roof. and smooth that down with my hands to prepare it for painting. And then I come in with the two-in-one primer and spray paint and just spray everything down. I don't add any glue or anything to the fur. The primer has enough of a bonding agent in it that it'll maintain its shape once it's sprayed. Moving on to a shingled roof. I've come up with this method where you draw a grid as seen here and I'll put the dimensions on screen and then halfway cut through each of these lines. So when you cut a strip off of the grid, you end up with this piece and you're able to bend back each shingle, trim each shingle to length, every other shingle to get some varied length on the shingles. And then you get a nice strip that looks like this that you just put one after another starting at the bottom to make a nice shingled roof. And this is by far the fastest method I've found for doing a shingled roof. It's still a little bit time consuming, but I think the results speak for themselves. They add so much detail and texture to the build that it's totally worth it. For our last detail, I like to add a little bit of coping by the chimney, a little bit of flashing, just for a little bit of extra realism and detail. Let's poke some nail holes in that too. Nice. To do the roof, I simply use bent pieces of the same cardstock and have them meet in the center, overlapping each other. So I paint that black. And with that done, it's time to do some of the infill between the beams. There are some little gaps from where I glued it together. And so I'm using some pre-made spackle here and rubbing it on all over the walls in between the timbers. The way a timbered house works is it's got uh, the exposed framing, the timbers, and then in between there's a filling structure that would be in this period usually probably made from wattle and daub. So by adding the spackle and then wiping clean the raised timbered areas, I can get a nice sort of texture in the center there that suggests this wattle and daub. And this is, as you can see there, it ends up with a nice texture. And I just add a little bit of black paint to touch up the areas where some of that spackle has dried on the black edges. And then for the next step, I wrap them in some blue tape just to protect that white and black part. And with gray and beige spray paint, I'm gonna hit those thatched roofs to give them a nice thatchy look. And look at that. Pretty satisfying. Let's build some stone walls that'll delineate the boundaries between the fields that these peasant cottages are presumably built up around. I start by making a rough sausage and then just building a wall. This is fairly basic. This is kind of how I did the first wall sections 20 years ago and uh, I was pretty happy with it. it. Lasted till now. Here you can see I got a 3D printed sheep. That's pretty cool. But I came up with this new technique and this is to add some realistic texture, which I didn't do 20 years ago. 
So I just push on either side into this polymer clay. And then I delineate some of the rocks again with a sculpting tool. And that just makes sure my wall is nice and detailed. That's going to give it a really nice realistic rocky texture for when I throw this thing in the oven and fire it off to make it rock solid. To paint the stonework, I came up with a new method as well. At least new for me. I mixed some browns and grays and a little bit of white. And I at first made this sort of warm gray and painted that onto all the stonework. The chimneys and the walls I just made both together. And then I came in with some lighter grays, but you know, I quickly realized that this was not the tone that I wanted to go for for the rock. I was looking at some reference images like this one here, and the stone always looked lighter. So I came back in with this off-white color, sort of a warm tan color, and then painted the occasional brick gray, but with the predominant tone still being this off-white color. This will set the basis for a nice warmer stone tone that I then hit with a black wash to tie in sort of the colors together and add some contrast to the deeper recesses and a bit of shadow. It dries a lot less stark than this once it's dry, but it looks pretty gnarly going on. But once I'd done that dark wash, here's a new technique. I used some pre-made spackle and watered it down so it was nice and thin, and then I just smeared it on there. I should mention I did a matte varnish layer on this before so I wasn't rubbing away too much of the wash, but then when I came in with a Kleenex that was wet and my thumb, I was able to wipe away most of the spackle and get a nice mortared look in between the stones. It was pretty brightly white so I added sort of a light brown yellowy wash to tone it down and to tint the spackle a little bit. And the results turned out awesome. So for the final details guys, I'm going to put some diamond pane glass into each of the windows. Now I know this isn't necessarily period accurate, but we're going to do it anyways. So I used some sculptor's mesh that I spray painted black, and this is an overhead transparency sheet. It's so transparent it almost disappears if you lay it down on the cutting board, but you can keep track of it if you're careful like me. So the thing to do is to cut a piece of your sculptor's mesh, then cut a piece of the transparency. And I just use hot glue around the outside and then squish them together. The hot glue part looks really bad, but I'm not going to put that part visible through the window. So it works out fine. And then you don't have to worry about clouding up the transparency film with a super glue or something like that. I just cut a piece like that. That's what it looks like up close. You can see it's got that diamond paint look. And then I just reach up into the building itself and glue it on there. Now, I realized there's way too many windows on this thing. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 windows just on this one thing, which in medieval times, 11 windows with glass in a humble cottage like this, there's no way, it's just not happening. But you know what? The reason I gave him so many windows is so I could do this. I turn on a tea light, pop one of those houses on top, you got a nice little fire glow effect inside. And I'm pretty happy with that. Um, you know, the fire glow would actually be better if I'd used something translucent rather than transparent, but that's neither here nor there. Now, you might have noticed during my ad for Warzone Studios that I was setting up these beast men lurking in the forest. And the reason why is because I wanted to set up a little diorama where these guys are lurking in ambush about to attack the medieval town. There's something so cool about the feeling of the unknown contrasted with the orderliness of human settlement. And that's really what you can do with this sort of build. And in addition, guys, it's worth thinking about that, you know, in present day, I think we just recently, a few years ago, passed the tipping point where now more than 50% of the world's population lives in urban centers. But in this time period, the medieval times that I based my fantasy around, it was closer to 95% people lived in rural areas. So you really want to have a well fleshed out set of materials to make a rural scene come to life if you want to put things in this time period because it really grounds it and makes it a lot more fun. 
So I hope you liked this video guys. If you did, like, comment, share, subscribe. If you decide to take a crack at a project like this or a project that's similar that you think I'd like, then tag me on Instagram or send me a message on there. I always love to see what you guys are working on. And uh, we'll see you next time on Eric's Hobby Workshop.